Hello, welcome to the uh, professional development program. And uh, today we're talking about mixing monitors. I wanted to get together a, a group of guys who know a lot about uh, the, the nature of monitor mixing, what it's like to deal with artistic temperaments, and uh, also uh, to talk about um, some of the technical issues obviously affecting, uh, especially monitoring these days. Um, we will talk about spectrum, because I think it's uh, pretty important. It affects everybody, of course, but in particular, the world of monitors um, is having to deal with that. So that's why we have with us today, uh, as we have three renowned monitors, well, front of house as well, I think, as well as monitors. But, <laughs> Multifunctional. Um, multifunctional. Yeah, 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 uh, happy to talk about monitors as well. Can you hear me? Um, no. But first of all, on my immediate left here is Tuomo Tolonen from Shaw Distribution UK. And uh, Tuomo also sits on the Berg Steering Committee, which is the industry group that is right now, has been for a few years now, dealing with the thorny issue of the digital dividend, which of course is the selling off of Spectrum, <laughs> mostly to mobile phone operators. Um, but it's made what's called PMSE, this sort of production end of the industry, uh, made, made life very difficult in trying to um, find frequency to use usefully in any environment, really. So Tuomo sits on a uh, committee. You had a steering meeting this week, didn't you, or last week? Just last week. Uh, so he's up to the minute information about what's happening with that. Um, but as I say, it's obviously a, a burning issue in all production, but especially monitoring. Um, next to Tuomo is a gentleman called Marcel van Limbeek, who uh, has been a monitor engineer for many, many years. His main gig is Tori Amos, who we all know and love, um, recording in the studio with her, as well as mixing monitors on at least 15 world tours. So I'm very, very happy to have him here today. Uh, then we have Mr. Justin Greeley, who I'm sure many of you do know. He's a soul sound tutor, um, dedicates a lot of his time to passing on knowledge and experience to uh, people coming into the industry. Very experienced at that. Um, and uh, a very experienced monitor engineer as well. And I read somewhere that you there is a verb to greel a stage, is this yeah, true? Yes, yeah, that's, that's actually John's. <laughs> Could you explain John's. that to everybody, what greeling a stage is? Uh, it's essentially it's obsessive labelling. Uh, I believe in uh, over-labelling everything, so if you do happen to fall over, uh, somebody else can come in and see clearly and easily what you've done. Uh, it makes stage work a lot easier, particularly if you have to go on stage in the middle of a show. You can clearly see what you need to do. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, I've made a bit of a career out of it. Uh, yeah, I'm Quite a... right, too. And at the far end is Mr. John Burton, uh, my old mate, and he's been a front house engineer for many, many great acts over the years, but also has done a lot of monitors. And I'm very pleased that he's agreed to sort of represent the world of monitoring today. Um, and the mon monitoring credits do range from TFI Friday, the TV show, to I've got Stereophonics, Prefab Sprouts, Wade, Brian Ferry, you know, it's pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. So I'm very pleased that John's here as well. Um, so, just to kick things off, um, I would like to ask the monitor engineers who, who, uh, who are here. Um, we all know what virtual sound checking is nowadays, I think. We can understand that. Um, I wanted to know, does that give you more free time before a gig? <laughs> if only. <laughs> no. Um, we kind of decided that uh, I was going to launch into this one. I kind of bagged this one first. Uh, I think virtual sound checking is the is a complete and utter waste of time, and it just Excellent. encourages navel gazing for front of house engineers. Um, for a monitor engineer, it's of no use to you whatsoever, really. There is no feedback because there's no feedback. There's no musicians playing on stage. Yeah, there's right. nobody trying to. The main thing as a monitor engineer is you've got to be talking to your artist. And you can't talk to your virtual artist, can you, about why it sounded shit last night? Because they, there's no feedback from it. It's a, and having a virtual drum sound check without the drummer sitting and playing the drums, I've always seen as a completely pointless task. I think it encourages the worst in engineering. And it encourages you to sit there and fiddle and fiddle and fiddle while everybody else sits around and listens to you. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> 
It's one opinion amongst many. Would you, anyone agree with that? Or Absolutely. Yeah, just, Absolutely. But you both do, right? All, all the way, although, uh, although I have to admit to, uh, to, uh, to sometimes, the only time when I think it's nice is when, uh, when uh, for instance, working with Tori specifically, when, uh, when I, she, she changes the set list on, on, on a daily basis, so she works up new songs, which sometimes it's nice if I have a recording of that so I can work on reverb effects mainly. Can, I can, fi I can you know, find the right algorithms for I the mean, effects and, and store that in. But yeah, that's beyond there is, that. There is a place for it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, if you've got a lot of backing tracks, running through the backing tracks is good. But you're not testing the lines. No. You're not testing the microphone. You're not making sure the microphone's in the right place. And there's you're no listening to there's a no, recording. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no. And the acoustics of the venue from the night before, unless you're doing like uh, arenas that were all the same size, and no two arenas sound the same. No, so exactly. it's good for testing effects. I use it for, oh, I've never used it to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, nor me. Well, and as a monitor engineer, it's 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 of no. It's just you're just waiting around for it to finish. Yeah, three <laughs> pointers. Yeah. Well, what is, another nail in the coffin for digital marketing uh, <laughs> phrases there. Quite right. Um, actually, coming on to uh, not virtual sound but um, this new technology. We did a session this morning. It's gone uh, talking about digital mixes for the real world getting onto iPads and things like that, and the way in which the interfaces are changing. Um, and in fact, I, I was talking to Leon just afterwards, and he, he raised some very interesting points, so I did want to put to you guys about this. Um, how, does, how does that affect you? I mean, is mixing on, on an iPad, for example, or something much more mobile tablet, does that enter your world at all, or are you rooted to the spot where, you know, uh, and the other question it will lead on to, I hope, is the fact that if that is possible, you know, are, are you needed all the time? And will there be some way in which, so, or would you start to have to wander around the venue? It's really mixing it up, and, and it, it, it's really confusing a lot of people about where it's going to go. Yeah. So, have, have you ever used an iPad? For no, I haven't, and I'm, I'm not really entertaining the idea, certainly not working with Tori. The thing with her is that, uh, I've been a monitor engineer for 20 years now, so we've become like one thing. So the, her monitor mix is extremely dynamic. So I need a tactile surface with faders. That's what I really need, you know. Uh, they can be minimized. I can do the, I can do them VCAs. I can do them on, on a small group of faders, but I need high quality faders and I need on and off buttons. Yeah, I don't wouldn't entertain uh, not for her to do it with an iPad for sure. I mean, I'm amazed by the technology what you can do, but. I've never used it so far. I know that John, you would even have one in the house, so you know. Well, uh, I mean, using an I mean, uh, I remember when TC Electronics first came out with the remote for the uh, 31 band graphic, which meant that you could push this box. It was a, a remote, but it was so heavy you couldn't carry it about, and you used to have to push it about in a flight case. But it made you could stand in front of a wedge, an EQ a wedge, and do something. To be able to do that on an iPad is incredible, and to be able to actually get on stage yeah. and make changes to a mix, standing where the musician is, uh, which when you're using wedges is incredibly useful. There is a point for it. I wouldn't trust an iPad during a show any more than I'd mix, any way that I'd guarantee to text anyone during a show, because it's just not going to work. If you're standing in a festival, try texting your wife at a festival and tell her you're going to be back late. She's never going to get the text. I wouldn't trust the technology in a built-up environment, like which comes back to the radio things that we're going to come to later. Uh, but during a sound check, that uh, mobility is is great, and I do I do appreciate that that it's becoming really useful. And I've worked with monitor engineers who've had iPads, worked across the stage, and been able to adjust mixes on the fly, and it's really great during the sound check. I I think it needs to be put in a drawer during the show, because during okay. a show you've got to be watching your musicians not trying to work out why you've lost your Wi-Fi connection. Why it's fallen over. Okay. Well, the other thing that, cre that came up was this, the fact that um, the technology falling into the hands of, of, more, of musicians and people and more and more bands running their own show and not being signed necessarily, or if they are signed, they're still taking a lot more control away from engineers. Um, is that kind of technology uh, actually uh, reducing the opportunities for people to get to move into monitoring no I don't believe it is actually because you still need somebody uh, to uh, get the stems right in the first place 
uh, mostly uh, musician mixing monitors uh, are using a series of stems or groups that come from a console somewhere and uh, it's very rarely uh, in a large concert format is it a front house desk so you need a separate set of mic amps and a separate mixing surface at least uh, in order to derive the stems and uh, <coughs> so really I don't think that uh, <coughs> Certainly at bigger shows, theatres, that kind of thing, I don't think that there's any, uh, any danger of there not being anybody uh, responsible for the audio on stage. Also, also I think that, uh, that many bands and acts, they, uh, they would much rather have a person there, because it's, it's an important thing, monitoring, if you can't hear yourself, you can't play, so it's important so they can have a face attached to that, you're going to look after that today, you know, I think that's important for them, you know. Well, well the other sort of technical uh, innovation uh, which it impinges on this directly is the personal monitoring system you know the, the musician having control over his or her immediate environment how does that dovetail into what you do i mean the, i've seen an increasing number of support bands coming out and they've got something like a, a behringer rack mount mixer on stage yeah. and they've all got ipads but it's not only replacing a monitor engineer um, but it's giving them the chance to get the same monitors each night and most of them have got a little iPad, and it, it does work out well for small touring, because when you can't afford a monitor engineer, and you can't afford a monitor mixer, and you can just do it from a little thing like that. So I'm seeing that increasingly happen. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it is, it is making its headway. Is really. it part of the professional development that's natural to the industry, that up to a certain level you'll do that, but then when you get to another level, you will we have rent, rented engineers and I mean, I think as monitor engineers, a lot of what we do is we, we manage a lot of audio channels and send it out to a lot of different places. Uh, your average musician, if they're stuck with 36 channels, they, they just don't know whether, they haven't got the time or the interest to start. So it does have yeah. to be subdivided down. It also becomes a trust issue as well as far as the artist is concerned. As, you, uh, as your show becomes more and more complex, uh, it becomes necessary to abdicate more and more responsibility particularly if you are playing a piano, for example, where your hands and feet are in use most of the time. It's extraordinarily difficult if you require uh, snapshots, ch changes tune for tune, uh, then uh, it's at a certain stage, you have to give up the responsibility to somebody else. Uh, and uh, that person, that individual, will need training, will need experience, will need to know your show, know the signals, uh, and to be interactive. Uh, as well as problem solving, because you know stuff breaks, and uh, that's really the crucial uh, it, yeah. downfall yeah. of the self-drive monitor system, uh, is that it's very hard to recover from error. Who's going to fix it? Yeah, yeah. If, if it's it, really hard to fix it from front of house. Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. It's you know, or whilst playing the guitar. Yeah, well, there's a lot yeah. to be said for you drums. know when it all goes horribly wrong, to be able to look across and go, you know, to someone at the side of the stage, you know, and just going. And, you know, and get them to come and fix it. Because your job as a musician is to be the musician, it's not to be the technician. And now, wedges. Uh, are they, yes, I know. I was going to ask if they're making a comeback. But, uh, Similar to these things we've got here. Uh, are they making a comeback? Did they ever go away? Uh, the, the loudspeaker manufacturers tell me all the time that, you know, despite IEM, uh, wedges are huge business for them still. Would you agree? They've never gone away. Right. You know, they've never gone away. I don't think. No, absolutely. There's, there's a whole uh, there's a whole section of the industry that are uh, particularly the old school, the rock and roll bands, yeah. punk bands, uh, who are polemically opposed to IMs and all the uh, the attendant technology, and uh, prefer good old fashioned loudspeakers. Okay. There's always been a market. Can they be combined with IM? Can they do? And how, how would you yeah, do most, that? Most tours are, uh, I've done combinations. Yeah, it's a combination. Yeah. yeah. How's that work? Well, it needs very careful management because it, yeah. you know, there are all kinds of issues in terms of phase, in terms of masking, in terms of delay. Time uh, alignment. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. that you really do need to be on top of, and you have to bear in mind that uh, particularly three and four driver. IEMs are really quite powerful tools and it's possible to hurt yourself, particularly in the long term, especially rehearsals actually, rehearsals are always the one 
because you're at it for what, five, six, seven hours a day instead of maybe an hour and a half or a two hour show. Uh, and you, it's quite easy to inflict uh, relatively long term hearing damage on both yourself and your artist. But it's true that musicians, a lot of musicians in rock music especially, feel isolated if they're using IMs. You know, they do feel a bit cut off from well, the, the groove. That's kind of uh, the responsibility of the monitor engineer, really. It is possible with uh, the uh, correct approach to ambient miking. Uh, to make it quite an interactive and dynamic and open environment for them. But it requires quite a bit of work. It's not a plug and play thing. You three or four sets of room mics that come up at different times that are compressed by a vocal or by a track, for example. One of the main problems is that if you've got in-ear monitors and you're listening to the drums, you know, when you get closer or further away from something, the sound doesn't always change. And after playing guitar for years, where you, if you can't hear the drums, you just go and stand a bit closer to the drummer for that bit. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't ch the sound doesn't get any louder. It's quite a big intellectual leap for people to make. And it's, you have to kind of explain to them. And the fact that you know, they become so reliant on what's being provided by the ears, where normally they just, you know, if you just take them out, you can usually hear things a lot easily. Yeah. Mm. But it's the, you know, it's, it's the cost you pay for the, for the freedom and for the fact that you can hear the clarity the vocalists get from hearing something right in the ear can't be matched by wedges a lot of the time. Yeah. You can also cheat a lot, of course, with in his uh, click tracks. For example, you know, shows that are played to a sequencer, yeah. very often people don't bar count anymore because they're cued by a click track appearing four bars before the guitar solo. Uh, so it can very easily become a really lazy tool uh, for musicians, particularly uh, big bands, big pop acts, for example, people who have to play uh, the same show every night without deviation because it's all to a click track, it's all to a sequencer or some kind. Well, they've of usually got uh, segments of the music playing back from the hard drive anyway, so it's the old thing about you know, cold play with four, four musicians and 200 plus channels. Well, there's not many tours now that don't have some kind of pre recorded content. Yeah. Yeah. Because people in the audience, I think, I don't know if it's the audience expect expectations or whether it's bands' expectation of what they think audiences expect. <laughs> they expect that, you know, people want to do the album. Yep. And your album, because Absolutely. nowadays, you know, you can do so many tracks. There's unlimited track count for an album. There's that, you know, you can just put on extra instruments, you can put on extra keyboards, and then you've kind of got the expect expectation to do that live. And the only way you can do it is with backing tracks. The only way you can sensibly tour an orchestra is on a hard disk. Yeah, well, it was um, Rob, Robbie Allen, who did the Mannix, he said he did them 20 years ago, and uh, there were still four of them, and they had 16 channels. 13 channels, he told me yesterday. And, uh, so and then you had to do it, he had to step in a couple of years ago, same band, and now there's only three of them, because one had disappeared and they had three times the number of channels. He went, it's the same number of musicians, what's happened? You know, just because more channels per instrument, more channels per you know, vocal and other stuff going on as well. And well, that's a live band. Because they can. Yeah. <laughs> because Which, they can. I mean, the, the biggest desk you used to be able to get was a 40 channel desk. And that was a big desk. You know, we used to, 32 channels was pretty much your average desk. You wouldn't write a channel list. I remember 24. Even. 24, yeah. You, yeah. You'd be, you wouldn't write a channel list longer than 32 channels. Yeah. And that still gave you no th room for effects. So you'd, you'd have to compromise. Now you could get, uh, you know, 196 channels and there's no limit to how many things you can do. Okay. So it doesn't, you don't edit as much as we used to do. Yeah. Do you do what front of house guys, uh, do in terms of creating a mix and then carrying it around on USB and then starting from there in the next the next venue the next night. Try to. Especially with IEMs. So. Lucky the great thing about the digital revolution is that you can now carry a USB stick which is going to work in every single desk that you come across <laughs> unless <laughs> they've altered it in any way like you've got a different model or a bit of it's not working or the disc becomes corrupted. I've I tried it on the last two I did monitors which was two years ago and I think I managed to get my disk file working first time once right. on, off a, off, on an American tour of about 30 consoles right, okay. without having to edit something. Or 
it was a great thing that was sold to us for the digital revolution and it hasn't really paid off. Not at all. There are all sorts of massive tripwires yeah. as far as uh, loading your own show files into guest monitor consoles or uh, um, festival monitor consoles particularly. If you don't know exactly what you're doing, then you can overwrite parts of the output patch, for example, or the EQ racks, the head amplifiers. There are all kinds of incremental saves that you have to do that you safe various parts of the console yeah. so as you don't overwrite what the festival guys have got plugged in because no one does it. No one assigns their mix outputs in the same way. Which is why we've got the ludicrous situation at some festivals where we've had... Uh, I've seen a festival this year where we had six profile consoles at the monitor desk, at monitor area, used by six different monitor engineers, where you could, in theory, just do it with one. With one yeah. But none of them would commit to using the house desk because they just knew bits of it wouldn't work. And that's not just one manufacturer. I think that's pretty much goes across, across the board, yeah. a board with manufacturers. Yeah. They haven't really addressed the problem of actual real life taking your show and making it work on all consoles. Because yeah. okay. they will use different desks, different formats as well. So you have to have eight show files. If yeah. you're doing a festival tour, you have to have uh, a show file for every single desk you're going to be using. Or you could just do it with an analog desk, which is a lot easier and faster. <laughs> but that's just me. It sounds better. <laughs> and it sounds better. And you've got no latency issues as well. Yeah. Where, where is Tony Andrews when you need him? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk about the psychology of it a little bit as well, while we're talking about monitors, generally speaking. Um, I did a session once about, with some record producers, and Stephen Street was on the panel. And Stephen uh, produced uh, Morrissey, Cranberries, a selection of the most um, sensitive souls that you could possibly find in the studio. Um, what strategies do you have to deal with uh, artistic temperament? Do you find that that's part of your job? I think this has got to be Marcel, actually, so, uh, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a commit. You know, you be, you, you be there for them. That's it. You know, no matter what. You know, you make it your job. You uh, you make it their, your job to uh, to uh, once the artist is on stage, you look after them. It's of your course. you're the host, more or less. You, you, it's it's their stage, of course. But whatever it takes, whatever it takes to uh, to uh, to uh, to comfort them, that's what you do. Can you train this, Justin? Can you can you train people to develop these skills as well as the technical skills? I mean. Uh, Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like being a butler, really. It's, uh, butler? Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> providing you can do the job of audio engineering, providing you can get your stage uh, with the loudspeakers and microphones working correctly, uh, then it's all about presenting out. You're the interface, basically, between the artist and the technology. Uh, and uh, a good monitor engineer will offer the artist uh, all the options they possibly can uh, without shooting himself in the foot. Um, I've made a rod for my own back on a number of occasions, but as I was saying earlier with the digital desks and letting artists know that you can actually have any cue you want, and you finish up with 200 of them in a show, um, which uh, maybe I would reconsider in hindsight, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's all about uh, making the artist as comfortable as possible. And little things like having a bottle of water and a towel by the monitor desk at sound check every day, uh, all that kind of stuff, making sure the microphone doesn't smell like it's been somewhere it shouldn't have been. Um, and things like stuff. making sure that, uh, that they never have to, 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 uh, to, to search for you. They always know where you are, you always look at them, you're kind of what John was saying yeah. earlier. You're, you're not, you know, it's, it's very You've important. Got to once, once my artist is on stage, I look at her, I'm totally focused on that, and I may look at my meter bridge for a second or two, but certainly no longer. That's it, you know, they, you want to give you've them the feeling that you care. You've got to be scanning the stage all care. the time. Yeah. You've, got to be, you've got to be scanning the stage and looking after your artist. Yeah. And if, they can't, if you're not looking at them when they look at you, then you're not doing a good enough job. Then, yeah, then it's disappointing for you. Them, know, even yeah. if your trouser is on fire, you're going to be, <laughs> you know, you've got to be looking at them and trying to catch their attention. Because it's usually fairly obvious, you know, if a singer's having a problem and they start nervously looking around at you, you know something's up, and then it's a question of getting, uh, having worked on some kind of communication. I mean, I, I actually inherited a gig of Justin's with uh, an incredibly difficult female singer. Uh, and he'd got this um, uh, thing where she just went, one meant I need more vocal, and two meant just give me some reverb as well because it makes it sound better. Uh, and I kind of kept that on. And then we introduced three, which meant if she did that, that meant uh, 
I don't know what I need, I just want it to be better. But as soon as she did that, it made her feel better because she knew that she was making a connection with me. Uh, and just building up, and you've got to build up confidence and trust with the, with the, the artist so that when they look over, they know that you're going to be somebody you're, there you're to watching help. for them. Yeah, yeah, exactly and that's yeah. your job, really. That's yeah. it, yeah. The, audience, yeah. The, art, the artist is always right, like, yeah. the, like the customer. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks, guys. Uh, Tuomo, I'm glad, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. We are going to talk about um, uh, IEM and uh, Spectrum. And um, we, you had a meeting last week, I believe, with the Berg Steering Committee. You're going to need my mic in a minute. I know. I was, um, is it true that um, the regulators seem to think that digital is going to be the answer? Uh, mistakenly, probably, but does that seem to be their sort of assumption that if we, if we all go digital, um, that'll solve all these problems? I think that'd be fair to say that's where we started from. I think Ofcom, and you know, we can, we can take this onto a European or global level as well, as it, it doesn't just have to be the UK. Um, it's definitely been an assumption early on, that is once the industry goes digital, as in we're talking about not digital audio, but the, the RF carrier yes. now being digital. You know, this cures all, all issues because it's more efficient, and you know, it's completely wrong. You know, it's very inaccurate. Um, you know, it really isn't about analog or digital carriers. It, you know, it could be like good antenna placements, you know, proper antenna selection, good coordination. Those are more important than whether you have an analog or digital carrier. And of course, you know, the situ I, I listen to this with interest, you know, when we talk about the, how important is, you know, the duty of a monitor and, you know, of course, you know, we see more and more people on IMs. And, you know, one of you mentioned how it's an earpiece right in somebody's ears. You can cause some serious damage if things go wrong. And of course, you know, of course, one of these could be a serious case of RF interference. You know, what do you do then when the, I don't know, what is, is four RF interference? You know, when you put four fingers <laughs> yeah. on because, you know, monitor engineers, um, they've got a job to sit beside, you know, behind a mixing console. But more and more these days, you're also tasked with sorting out the RF. And of course, if you spend all your time sitting there making sure the mix is right, it could all fall down on just the poor frequency coordination. Mm -hmm. You know, and these d discussions we had at Ofcom, uh, you know, can be very frustrating, to be fair. You know, I think it'd be fair to say, in general, the industry is more using more and more wireless these days, be it radio mics or IMs. And it becomes more critical than ever before to understand how to set these things up. And again, this is everything from coordination to antennas to cables to troubleshooting. Um, but yet we find ourselves continuously losing more spectrum. Sorry? Uh, now, I mean, we, we lost the 800 megahertz band a few years ago that I think everybody's familiar with. And to be fair, if I'm honest, um, from a coordination point of view, that wasn't necessarily critical. We've had a fair amount of UHF spectrum in hand. But um, you know, if you follow the developments closely, um, the 700 megahertz band, or 694 meg and up to 790, um, will go away. Um, this will be announced at the World Radio Conference uh, next month. And this, this puts a huge squeeze on shows. I mean, it really does. You know, now we start looking at dealing with a couple hundred mega spectrum. And you have to realize that digital television, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, we share spectrum with broadcasters. All those DTV channels that currently sit in the 700 megahertz band have to be repurposed and moved down into the 600 meg band. So it's not just losing the availability to have 700 for usage, it's whatever else was in there joins us as well. So, you know, it really is one of these push yourselves into yeah. the corner as much yeah. as you can. Um, and again, yeah. this whole coordination becomes even more critical, yeah. you know, it's because now, you know, and I've seen this so many times, it's a, you know, there's RF interference and well, how, how do you troubleshoot that? It's so important to understand that, and not just be a good monitor engineer, but a good RF engineer. I mean, I've, I've, I've been touring, uh, I tour, I've been touring a scanner to scan the RF at the venue since I was doing the stereophonics back in 90, 1990, no, 2000, sorry, 1999, 2000, <clears throat> because it got so bad then that you, you had to try and find out where you could put your radio systems. Because on the previous tours, I was doing Lighthouse Family, and I had, <clears throat> it was like 14 in-ear systems, and you know, it's five radio mics, and it was getting really bad then. Nowadays, if I've just come back from America, doing festivals in America, and we were, we were struggling, we were renting in 
extra radio sets. We own, I mean, I was touring with the Prodigy, we own, uh, we've got three or four channels of radio mic for each singer. We've only got two singers. Just because we have to have at least three working at any one time because we know that at one point in the set, one of them's going to drop out because we're at festivals with loads of other RF. Then we've got spare in ears. We're carrying so much spare stuff just to get through a show so we know we can get through a show. And then we almost, we got to the point in Chicago where there's so much loose RF dropping in on the order where we're supposed to have clean RF. There was TV stations, uh, just, just rubbish that you just don't even know what it is. And you look at the map and it's like the New York skyline if you scan it. And you're trying to find, and you're trying to find a little gap where you can stick your little radio mic. And it's a real issue. And it's really bad in America. And that's, uh, that is coming here. Because we're going to sell off, you know, all the frequencies and just obliterate the, the uh, entertainment industry. Because we're the smallest and we've got the least amount of money and we bought the least licenses. I mean, you bring up a few great points. So you mentioned scan, uh, you know, a lot of times. It really is imperative that, you know, systems are set up properly. It's not a case of just picking up a frequency and hoping it works. And increasingly more of the channel counts just keep going up. And, you know, you sort of allude to what's, what's heading our way. So, you know, losing 700 meg is one thing. But um, the latest uh, discussion was actually a statement that was issued, um, uh, what's today? Today's Monday, so uh, last week, early last week. And this has to do with, um, uh, white space devices, and this started with the consultation originally in 2010, where Ofcom basically said that. So this would this would have been unlicensed uh, devices that would share spectrum with you know PMSE, and um, Ofcom laid out very strict criteria that these had to match. So technical criteria that they wouldn't cause interference to incumbent users, you know, which would be monitors, uh, you know, radio mics, and so on and so forth. None of these prototypes uh, worked, these white space devices. And just last week, the statement uh, introduced what's called manually configurable white space devices and openly says in there that, you know, we, we agree that this now increases the risk to incumbent users, but the opportunity or the financial opportunity of delaying this outweighs the risk of increased interference. And, you know, I listen to that, and that's not a slap in the face. You know, that's somebody smacking me with a shovel yeah, in the yeah. face. You know, and but overall, what it does is it's just that you know continuous squeeze of spectrum, um, and I guess you know we're partially to blame. We're all suckers for, you know, mobile technology and phones and you know the Wi-Fi. Yeah. yeah. What are uh, cognitive wireless devices? Tim? Well, that would be a device that has the ability to to move around, right? so jump around, and um, and this is what white space devices should have been. Uh, cognitive devices that automatically talk to a geolocation database. So geolocation databases, the way the process was going to work, as, as Ofcom laid it out, is that you have an event, uh, you license your radio microphones, and those frequencies now part of a database. So for a white space device to operate, it would have to talk to this said database. And if your frequencies are in use, uh, of course, these devices are now no longer be permitted to send or receive data. What happened is once these databases or examples of them were built up, and there was a few great working ones we saw at Ofcom that you know BBC engineers, for instance, had put together, it created a no-go zone in all of central London, which is accurate if you ask me. There is no white space because you're all using it. <laughs> yeah. And of course, now white space devices wouldn't have anywhere to go. So again, what you start seeing is the rules get more and more relaxed to let them come in. Um, so a cognitive, this is what it was intended to be, is you know, move around uh, and avoid your frequencies. But if you ask me, is once these devices didn't meet the strict technical uh, criteria that was set out in 2010, the project should have been dead. That was it, you know, the, the entire scope of it changed at that point. So it, it is frustrating, but you know, nonetheless, I think this is where we have to keep talking to the regulators and engaging with them. Lobby your local MP. Mm. Uh, and uh, put pressure on where you can. Uh, just time for a few questions from the floor, if there are any, uh, for these illustrious engineers. Are there any monitor engineers in, in our audience? Who's a monitor today? engineer? Who does monitor? Who actually does? Aha. I mean, uh, an advice for monitor engineers is talk to musicians. This is the one thing I say to any, uh, anyone who's going to do monitors. And if you're a front of house engineer who has to deal with monitors, the most important thing is to go and talk to your artist and walk about the stage during the sound check and listen to what's coming out of the, art, the monitors 
and see what it sounds like. I think you'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As much put yourself, as you can. Put yourself in, the, in, in their position, uh, uh, find out what it's like for them to, to, to do their job, you know, and see if you can help out, you know. Uh, involve yourself, you know. Uh, yeah. You want to be seen as somebody who works hard and cares a lot. I think, yeah. in any case, in the lifestyle industry, but specifically when you're a monitor engineer. And don't be scared of musicians, because they're, yeah. you know... Well, you're mixing for them, not for yourself, so you kind of have to get inside their head in order to do it properly. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. Yeah. Right yeah. Question. One, two, oh, hello. Um, hi, I've done a bit of engineering, and I'm also a musician. And I, it's not a question, I just wanted to um, reiterate what was said earlier about the importance of making eye contact with the musicians on stage. Because I've been in the unfortunate position where I know I've got a, maybe a split second opportunity in a song to ask for something or signal something. And I, I've had that horrible moment where that second's coming up or that split second's coming up and I've gone for it and the monitor engineer is not looking at me. And it's a really horrible feeling, so... It's opening a can yeah. of beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, yeah. screen, put put your iPhone in a drawer or in your bag during a gig. Yeah. There's no time to be doing Facebook if you're a monitor engineer, because your responsibility, the only time you're actually any use to the artist is in that hour that they're on stage, and you should be giving them the, your undivided attention, or you yeah. should be doing a different job. It doesn't work with Stevie Wonder, by the way. <laughs> Cruel, but fair. Has anyone done monitors with Stevie Wonder? <laughs> oh, no I'm much. sure he's got hand signals, but... If <laughs> <laughs> How do they do it? It's, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I was really naughty. Um, you, you find a way around it because you know uh, it is a real question though. I mean, how do you work with with people with poor eyesight, or unsighted people, or people who who do something with back to you? Uh, you you go up and have a conversation with them. You know, if you're working with uh, a blind pianist or something, which I have done in the past, you go and say, you know, like, uh, have you got any way that you normally signal to a monitor engineer to tell them if you want something? He went, yeah, I point to the piano and then do an up sign. <laughs> or I do a downside. It's not rocket science, really. A lot of what we do in this, you know, the complex signalling, guitar, up. You yeah, know, yeah. Sometimes they'll get you'll get weird ones. Oh, it's backing track, like some tape machine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're not like using we backing use tracks. Tape. We're using tape machines. <laughs> well, that works, you know. But you just you just have a conversation. It comes out a conversation with the musician. And often, if you know an artist for a very long time then they don't even need to give you signs no longer because yeah. you know. They just give you a look. Yeah, they give you a look and you and know, you oh, something is And you will meet up. artists who you'll... can just re do a really good look and you just go, yeah. I'm dead, mate. It's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was at, um, later with Jules once and uh, David Bowie was playing on the show and they got halfway through Ashes for Ashes and I was wondering, the, the look that the guitarist was giving, they had some kind of monitor guy in that environment, in the TV studio. And it was about halfway through Ashes to Ashes when I realized I was standing in between him and the little antenna behind me. It was a sure as well at the moment. So I just like slightly moved to the left a little bit like that. But the look that David Barrow's guitarist gave that monitor engineer, I was frightened the living daylights out of me. You have to be Teflon, really, to be honest. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And it's it's, it's going like, to be your fault. Shit. Most of the things that are your fault are... Well, that was my related. fault. It wasn't his yeah. fault, me. I, you know, he was going to get <laughs> sacked, probably. I mean, you're awful. just going to get blamed for anything. You know, yeah, the yeah, guitarist yeah. overslept. That's obviously your fault. They all got drunk. They only just woke up. That's your fault. Yeah. But you just got to deal with it. That's when you need a virtual sound check, though, when they oversleep. <laughs> That's <laughs> when it really comes well. in handy. When they're all That's when we just play over. CDs. See, bands just get in the way of the technology, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, It'd be really. a lot easier without all these musicians Yeah, get rid of the artists and just have some really cool stuff on stage. But then we'd have to have video. And that's Actually, just that would be a craft world world tour, wouldn't it, basically? Virtual uh, sound checks the wrong way around, though, isn't it? The band should be on stage and we should be in bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah virtual right. roadie. Yeah. Well, I did ask, do you get more free time before a gig? And you said no. I thought, well, why not? You know, Surely. Anyway, we digress. Any more questions from the floor? It's been fun. I had a quick a quick question. Um, more and more of the venues that I've been using are using things like Dante Networks, etc. And it actually relates to signal splitting. Um, and there seems to be more pressure to use gain compensation um, from a single split source. Um, personally, I still want to see a good analog splitter. Um, do you feel this is the, the case as well? I'm not in 
entirely sure what it is you're trying to split. Oh, um, so for example, just the... Uh, oh, a gain sharing, things yeah, like gain, that. Yeah, things like gain sharing, well, gain sharing right. a, single, a single point um, stage box. Um, feeding multiple devices with game sharing and, and game compensation. You've got to, have, you've got to, be, like you've got to work with your engineer. If you're a model engineer, you've got to have, you've got to be having conversations with the front of house engineer, and you've got to make it known to the front of house engineer that yeah, he may want the signal a little bit hotter, but he's entirely going to fuck up your day, and you've got to, you know, and you've got to make it very plain that that's the case, uh, which takes a while, really, doesn't it? There's a whole issue of networking uh, yeah. hierarchy. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you talk to Digico, Very much there is. they'll say, oh, we don't mix anymore. We have a network, a sort of loop. And yeah. well, who's in charge? Well, the, the monitor guy can go on here. The front of house can go on here. There's all the system text, the, guitar, the musician's text. And they've got a passworded hierarchy going on about, you know, yeah. what you can change and what you can't. Because it's open to It's monitor engineers going to be the king. The monitor, I mean, having done uh, lots of front of house, lots of monitor engineer, for my stage... The monitor engineer is in charge of everything. Because when the shit goes down, he's got to go and deal with it, and he's going to be dealing with the consequences of my incompetence. And surely, you're the person that makes the performance better. The monitor engineer, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. the band aren't going to play that well unless you're doing your job absolutely right. It doesn't matter how good it sounds up front. They're going to hear a worse performance a lot better yeah. if the front of the house engineer is good and, and you're not doing your job properly. You've got to work as a team is the main thing. To, to come back to your question, I think uh, when, when it comes to things like gain sharing, the, the, my, my, my honest answer is that if, if you're giving me any sort of situation that is an unknown, it's, say imagine if me and John were going out on tour with a band we've never worked for, I wanted to be independent and so would John want to be. But uh, working with Tori, for instance, uh, because my friend Mark from the house engineer for Tori, we've been working together for 25 years now. So in that situation, we, we know each other very well. And that's the sort of situation where you can do things like game sharing, because we know exactly what we're going to do. Do you know what I mean? So we trust each other. But it's kind of unique a little bit. Well, in, certainly rare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in most situations, I agree with you. You want to be as flexible as possible. Yeah. I think it's one of the reasons why front of house engineers tend to stick with monitor engineers that they're used to working with, because you've got to build up a level of trust. And you've got to have a conversation, right. you know. Absolutely. You've got to be a team. Yeah, you've yeah, got to yeah, be a yeah, team. Yeah. Me and Justin work together on, on lots of tours, and, you know, I just leave it to him. I let him all do all the, he do all the hard work, and I just he spend hours labelling stuff the up. <laughs> greeling. the stage, and then I just stand in front of us going, it'll all be fine. Can you turn it Trust. down a bit? Yeah, can just turn it all down all the blame a bit. as well. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic stuff. Thank you. Uh, John Burton, Justin Greeley, Marcel Van Limpik, Tuomo Tolerant, thank you very much for coming on today. And thanks thank for your questions.